So the Commission for Smart Government is looking at how the UK government can become a more uniformly high performing organization end to end across the whole body. Better use of technology and data are at the core of this. Last month, the Commission published a package of, of proposals setting out how government can regain momentum on its digital program. With the right ambition, leadership, focus and investment, we can see genuine, meaningful transformation in public services, better, cheaper, faster and more responsive. So with that, I wanna hand over and do quick introductions from our panelists. Um, so I'll start, my name is Marie Seventon. I am the CEO of Ada's List. We're a global community of women who work in and around technology, but I have a, a passion for digital government. I was one of the first employees at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in Washington, DC. We set up a digital first organization uh, in 2010 and built our tech team um, and really released a lot of data sets and services that have not only changed the financial sector in the states, but also have delivered a lot of good to a lot of Americans who need it. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Daniel for quick introductions. Thank you very much, Rizzi. Uh, I'm Daniel Korski. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Public. We're a technology venture and services firm uh, that focuses on transforming public services uh, with new technology. But prior to that, uh, I spent some time in government too. Um, <clears throat> uh, latterly as the deputy data policy in number 10, where I spent a lot of my time focusing on exactly the issues we're discussing today, you know, how can we reform and innovate so the public service is delivered better. And Marisi, I just wanted to quickly say uh, it's a real pleasure to have you chair us because some of the work that you did at the Consumer Protection uh, Bureau was really foundational for a lot of digital government that came uh, afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Hussein, do you want to do you want to go next? Great. Good morning, everyone. So I'm one of the three co-founders out on Fido. Uh, we started the company around eight years ago with a focus around helping businesses digitize, specifically their onboarding journeys with a government ID and facial biometrics. We use machine learning as our uh, approach and have been involved with a number of different organizations and banks as they go through the digitization process. So really looking forward to the panel today. Fantastic. Thank you. Radhika, I'm going to hand over to you. Hi there. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm Radhika Chadwick. I'm a partner in McKinsey's London office. I have a background uh, in the public sector, primarily the UK public sector, and I've spent about 25 years, closer to 30 now perhaps, in complex strategic transformation with a particular focus on the modernization and the digitization of the public sector in the UK. Um, I work with clients on generally major change agendas, so developing a national AI strategy, digitizing the rail industry, transforming the courts and prison system, navigating structural changes like Brexit, and you know, most of all, implementing digital transformation programs. And before um, joining McKinsey, I was with EY. I led the central government sector and the uh, global lead for digital and AI in government. Um, and I'm also co-founder of a cross-industry AI expert group focused on the societal impact of technological employment and technology changes. So delighted to be here. This is a topic I've been thinking about and working on in some way, shape or form for about 27 years. And, you know, I'm delighted to part, be a part of the conversation today. Fantastic, thank you so much. So I'm gonna kick off with some questions, but for all the attendees around, you can go ahead and ask any questions through the chat function and I'll be reading them as we go along. As you can tell, we have quite a panel of inside and outside experts. And so I think that's that's what's unique about this. We have, uh, we have startups, we have deep government expertise as well as the larger consultative transformation projects. So these are the people to ask your questions to. So I'm gonna kick off. Um, so first, first question of the day, and it's, it's no big deal. What should be the top priorities for the government's incoming tech leadership team? Give us two, one to two, or six, not 60, give us one or two. Daniel, I'll, I'll start with you. I want to kick off with something really simple, which is their challenge is to put digital transformation at the heart of the government's objectives. Now that sounds logical, right? I mean, these are you know digitally uh, entitled individuals. What else would they do? But I think that there's a real danger that those in charge of technology roles kind of focus inward on the projects that are at hand, as opposed to realizing that that the the, the tools that they can bring to government should be brought to the government's core priorities, whether that is 
um, leveling up or whether that is ensuring uh, you know, the smooth running of the UK's trade relationship with countries or, or, what, or net zero. So I think the first thing to say is, you know, make it a core priority, not just to sort of manage the digital projects that you are in charge of, but to make digital transformation a core uh, part of the big priorities of government. Um, so that would be my first. And then I would go to some of the recommendations that we've laid out in the report that try to kind of do that by saying, you know, create a digital council at the center of government, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. I think the second thing I'd say is try to rebuild government services around the way a modern organization or a company like Odfido or others would, would operate, right? Uh, rather than try to build services that add technology onto them. Uh, and I think that would be my second big challenge, which can they imagine services in the way that we suggest in the commission report uh, built around, you know, cloud with microservices, with, you know, identity and payment solutions uh, at their core, um, so that we're not just adding a little bit of a digital twinkle to what was created 200 years ago. Thank you. And I think, you know, what made me reflect on that in the paper is some of the recommendations actually had the the types of journeys that a, an end user like myself would use. So looking at early years functions as, a, as an example of an end-to-end -end service that cuts across different levels of government, but can really transform that service delivery if you bring together a cross-functional team. So thank you so much. Radhika, I'm going to go over to you. What, are your, what would your top priorities be? Yes, yeah, so I would agree with, with Dan, but let me add a little bit of a nuance to that. I, I absolutely agree. You've got to reset ambitions and expectations. You know, there is um, too much tolerance, I think, for, you know, failed projects that never get reevaluated and, you know, never get challenged um, and, and, you know, levers that don't get fixed. So I would say the three things are, first of all, reset the ambitions and the expectations. Um, I would say, secondly, I think the, the government's incoming tech leadership team needs to have a really honest look at the key levers, you know, a really honest look at the skills, a really honest look at the funding, really honest look at the decision making authority, and also the safety net that's provided to people who are asked to challenge something, but not necessarily supported all the way through. So a really, really honest look at the levers needed and, you know, and, and the willingness to set aside barriers in order for this to be successful. And I think the third thing is, I think there's a mindset here that is really important in that this is an extraordinarily complicated thing to do. And it's never going to happen through one champion or you know, one, one hero. Um, this is going to be a whole ecosystem effort. And so there has to be a way to bring the public sector as a whole and the private sector as a whole and the social sector and the third sector in, in alignment uh, to be able to solve some of the, the problems that aren't necessarily just specifically digital, but they are cross-government and cross-society and have cross-government and cross-society implications. Thank you so much. And I, I, the, I completely agree. One of the things that really stuck out with me was, you know, the decision-making authority. I think that, that with the GDS, that was an, a great example, but it, 10 years ago of how GDS had a great authority, but now it's time to to extend that further. It's time to kind of look at how, what authorities these, team need, these teams and services need to actually be able to deliver their work. Thank you so much. All right, Hussein, over to you. What are your top priorities? It's just what's already been shared, but I would, if, if you want a summary version of two key things, I would have an infrastructure one and then like an organizational one. The infrastructure one ought to be doing whatever possible to help different departments or third parties self-serve what they need uh, for instance, so it's common cloud infrastructure, open uh, APIs, common standards and components. So that the infrastructure is there so that if any units or any department wants to digitize, maybe sooner than another, then they don't have to go through a whole uh, many different hoops and the infrastructure exists for them to be able to digitize uh, in their own pace. The second, uh, as far as whether it's organizational or cultural, it's, it's very much, as Daniel mentioned, it's to consider these initiatives as cross-functional, uh, cu cutting across different departments, and that's having cross-functional teams or digital task forces and others to recognize just the way that most scale-ups and startups do. There are so many complexities involved in these digitization projects. This often runs over a number of years and touches multiple different areas of, of governments and beyond. And therefore they should be thought of as cross-functional. And the challenge you have is the mindset historically has always been department-based and siloed. 
Whereas if you have cross-functional teams and, and sort of digital task forces, there's ownership given to this key individuals in charge of these initiatives so that we can make sure that we see them through to fruition. Thanks, I love that. And I love actually empowering these teams with, with the ability to deliver this and to have the decision-making authority. That's, that's really great. Thanks so much. Uh, so in the changes that you just outlined and your priorities that you'd wanna see, and Hussein, I'll start with you. What do you think the, the greatest challenges are going to be in implementing the change of this order? And how would you kind of give some advice on how to address those? Um, so there are a f the, the, the biggest one, I think, is the necessary necessity to see these as long-term projects. If there's a fu fundamental and foundational work to be done, uh, they will cross beyond uh, an election cycle of four or five years. And therefore, um, to see these as five, 10, 15 year projects uh, that become independent as far as uh, possible, and that immediate returns are not expected. These are very much sort of um, uh, for the long haul. Another part of it is, uh, as, as one of the questions already is, that has come through regarding like data and, and privacy and so on, there is an education piece in, to, to be had around. It's not necessarily a trade-off between holding more data means less security or less privacy and so on and so forth. There, there is the NHS, for example, holds a lot of data on everyone and uh, health data. And because we kind of trust them to, to be able to protect that properly, the technology exists to protect data in a very strong way and anonymize where, where relevant and where possible. So that digita greater digitization should not in any way equate to great, uh, greater surveillance state or anything like that. And it, there's an education piece to be done to uh, help um, policymakers in particular not have to be too worried about making progress on the digitization front, uh, fearing a, a backlash and there's an education piece that is missing. Great, thanks so much. Radhika, what would you suggest the greatest challenges are and how, and how should we overcome them? Uh, so it's an interesting one. You know, I think we could all list many, many, many challenges, right? And it's actually quite easy to almost get lost in how many things have to happen uh, and how many things, you know, we need to address from sort of cross-functional working. And, and we can have a long list. I mean, our, our, the, the paper that Dan's produced has got 60 things in it. But I guess if you take a step back, you think, you know, this is a giant change. And when the private sector looks at making giant changes, it almost always begins with leadership. And it's a different kind of leadership that's required to drive change than you would need to have in a, a stable operating environment. And I think just beginning with the right kind of visionary and operational leadership that drives change. Uh, and, and these people look, you know, the people who do this in the private sector look very different. They're not, they don't often sit inside the organization. They are, you know, occasionally brought in from outside. They don't stay long-term with organizations. They often sort of drive a particular set of changes through and then, you know, leave after a few years. But there is a different mindset and a different personality type that drives change. And I think finding a way to bring them inside, uh, you know, and then I guess the second question is how many of them do you need? Do you need to replace, you know, half the civil service? No, I don't think so. I think critical mass is actually just a handful of people in each department who will drive this kind of change in and amongst your, your, your stable operations. So finding the leadership, recognizing the different, figuring out what the barriers are to bringing them in, sweeping those barriers away getting them in place, giving them funding, giving them authority, giving them responsibility, supporting them when things go wrong. And, you know, enabling that to happen, I think is probably right front and center for me at the heart of all the other things that have to happen. I completely, I completely agree. And, and one thing I'd add on is, is not just the leaders to deliver, but also the, the political leaders to provide that top cover. You know, I think at the CFPB, we were very lucky that we, Elizabeth Warren basically was like, you guys can do whatever you want. And she went to bat with, for us, for our, you know, our little tech and digital team all of the time. because She understood that the policy delivery would not happen without, without it getting into the hands of the people that needed it. And so I think like ha having the visionary leadership is from the political and the policymakers as well is, is critical to to really helping drive the transformation at, at pace. Uh, Daniel, did you, did you have anything to add on the greatest challenges? Um, I, I think we've covered something that I totally agree with, which is, do you have high level buy-in? Um, and I think it's important to distinguish that as I think you're doing between having a sort of nerd in chief and having, i.e. somebody who is incredibly well-versed in this 
issue, which is something on the whole we have come to expect from Estonian prime ministers and Finnish prime ministers, but something on the whole we don't tend to see with you know German chancellors and American presidents and so on. But but I also don't think that it's necessary. You know, we don't we don't like great CEOs that run great digital businesses aren't necessarily great engineers and great developers. Sometimes they are, um, but 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 they don't have to be. And similarly in politics, what we need are leaders who get this agenda, give space for this agenda to take place, um, you know, remove the obstacles. And I think the biggest issue we face is that without that leadership, which has frankly been, you know, patchy, uh, I would say, at least since 2016, um, but I'm obviously party pre, uh, without that leadership, some of the hardest problems, and I think it speaks to what Hussein was saying, which are problems to do not with what goes on in one department, but what goes on across departments. Some of these problems cannot be cannot be fixed because there's nobody on top saying, "Come on, like we we these guys have the power. I vest them in the, in them the power to use digital means to solve some of these cross government problems." Uh, and so I think that the absence of that clear leadership um, is is one of the great challenges. And there's every reason why it it can emerge now that the government is is you know has effectively. Um, moved on to uh, a post-Brexit agenda. Uh, and so I'm very hopeful for what can happen. Thank you so much. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I'm viewing this as, as, a, as a 100, we have, a, we have an opportunity to create a 100 day plan and this is the outline for it, right? How, what does a 100 day plan look like and, and, and how do we create that, that energy and that, um, and that ambition? Uh, so my next question is going to is going to kind of transition into the skills. So we've talked a little bit about the leadership required both at the senior level, at the political level, as well as the implementation level. So the nerd in chief or however you want to put that. Um, but then from a day to day level and implementation, how does government ensure it has the necessary skills to implement an ambitious digital reform program? And I'll just open it to our panelists. Maybe I can start. So as a starting point, I think we will be in a much better place in 25 years in the sense that the new generation coming through are digital first. So anything that is antiquated or, or essentially disconnected or not uh, uh, available on an API and, and, and so on will be alien to, the, to them. Uh, and so we have this gap to fill in the meantime, because it's a long time to wait. And therefore, um, as part of the recommendations, this sort of basic leveling up as sort of basic training and skill skills uh, improvements around what capabilities there are and what capacity there may be and examples from other countries as policymakers get engaged with uh, and key decision makers around how to improve things just having technology at the forefront of, of other possibilities and options and we're lucky in that a growing number of countries the great case studies there are actually many cases within the uk itself but uh, as daniel was mentioning in, in the chat box uh, they don't always get attention uh, as much as they deserve so that's uh, an important part and one other thing uh, that, that comes with this is historically the notion of having, if this is all seen as a project to basically do, it's typically outsourced. And there are very many examples where things ought to be outsourced. But when you're considering a, a significant tech infrastructure improvement that's gonna rely and power many other initiatives, I think there's something to be said for having a move towards having some of this brought back in house with uh, skill sets and trained expertise that can not just develop, but also maintain and improve. Because the thing with technology is it's continuous. Every five years, the last stack, tech stack that we're using may be outdated, but at the very least needs continuous improvements. So this um, having this ability to bring a greater number of the skill set in house, I think should help too. Can I pick up on this? I think that, um, that, that, that Hussein's comment is brilliantly hopeful in a way that I, um, I also feel. And, and I love this sort of idea of, well, how do we bridge the gap until people actually know more about the subject matter at hand? And, and I think, let me try to address kind of that, that, that question um, by comparison, which is if you look at a lot of other things that government bureaucracies consider critical to their successful functioning, you know, uh, an understanding of budgets, an understanding of parliament, uh, in the foreign office, an understanding of languages, um, uh, in the Ministry of Defense and it's an understanding of weapon systems. Uh, government is pretty good at, at determining it within departments and within sectoral domains what you have to know in order to oversee something. 
Oh, uh, can it get better? Sure. Is it no, always good in every uh, department? No, but there's a broad kind of understanding. So a good example by analogy is in the foreign office. If you apply to become a diplomat somewhere, you're incentivized to learn another language. You'll be paid more if you learn it. The better that you get at it, the more you'll get paid. Uh, but you're not sort of left to your own devices to go and learn the language as you wish in cafes and bookshops. No, there's a training offer. Uh, it's pretty well structured. And as a result, unsurprisingly, the Foreign Office is full of people who speak a myriad of languages from Albanian to, uh, to, to Cantonese. Uh, well, why would we not do something similar when it comes to, um, you know, a broad conception of technology and digital skills, right? These are the roles that we consider uh, uh, that you need a certain uh, understanding of certain things. We don't need you to be a coder. We don't need you to, 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 to have built products. Um, and, and, and maybe in the role, you'll never have to do that, but you are responsible for a number of things that have a core digital component and the digital component will probably be uh, critical to whether your policy works or not. Ergo, you ought to have certain skills. And by the way, here's the incentive. You can be paid more if you attain those skills. And by the way, here's the, the or many of the offers available for you to attain those skills. And so I think we need a much more rigorous approach to upskilling in the gap that Hussein talks about until kind of people arrive on stream more naturally uh, adverse in, in, in these subjects. Fantastic, thanks. Radhika, did you want to comment on, on this as well? I think this, I'm going to make a couple of quick points. Um, first of all, you know, there is a range of skills needed at a range of different levels. I mean, this is a giant agenda. So you do need, you know, digital skills at the top departmental level and ministerial level. You know, there is a, a level of understanding that has to be brought in. You've got to bring in that critical mass of top digital leadership, which has its own skills and, and it might require new people, but it might require upskilling people who already sit in there. You need to raise the general skill level across the civil service and you then also have the general cohort of digital skills that yeah, it, the, the digital talent and and so first of all there isn't a one size fits all i think you know there is generally sort of a, a drive towards you know better understanding of, of this which is really really important it also brings up a point that as you begin to digitize services there's a change in skills required of the people who are you know, being affected by the digitization. So that's a, a part of the skills agenda not to be forgotten. And then another angle on this is digital skills are incredibly uh, rare, actually, as a global marketplace. And what COVID-19 has done is shown us that you know, it is actually quite possible, seeing as we're on this, this, this panel sitting in my, you know, my, my study here and, and everyone else's study, to be incredibly mobile. So digital skills have become unbelievably mobile. And what we're seeing is an increasing pull from international governments to capture some of the best digital skills without having people having to move at all. And so the competition for these digital skills is increasing as well. So, you know, if I, if I can, you know, leave this topic with one interesting, uh, you know, challenge, you know, why, why wouldn't we, um, is top, top government leadership, have a conversation with 50 people in the industry and 50 people inside government who are reformers? you know, figure out the barriers to actually um, bringing these people in and unleashing them and creating sort of the, the skilling that's required and then aggressively remove those barriers. So there's something which is really practical about figure out what it is and then fix it um, that, you know, I think we need to be slightly better at. Yeah, thank you. I, the competition is hot. I, I run a jobs board as part of my as part of my day job, and uh, it's been actually a bright spot though in the midst of a pandemic to see to see how many employers are hiring and you know looking for women in technology as well. So I I completely agree. And there's one really not interesting thing I'm going to add to this conversation, and it's really boring, but. What happens a lot is when this talent comes to government, the tools that they actually have to work with are of a different era. And I think that there are some, there's like a basic foundation of how we define good tools. I mean, you can use the word Slack, you can use the word Teams, like collaboration tools, the ability to actually write a document and collaborate on that documentation is really important. And I think that until we fix some of those basics, not really uninteresting things, it's going to be hard for people to do their jobs well once they get in. Um, it's it's such a boring conversation, but it's actually some of the most important. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, so uh, we've kind of had a bit of conversation around in, in the chat around the uh, decentralization 
there's a centralized approach to implementation. Um, and I just wanted to put this out to the panelists to see kind of what your thoughts are, you know, when you're looking at all of the recommendations, the task force, or um, all the different task forces, the, the councils, at the core, uh, what are kind of the pros and cons of a centralized versus decentralized approach? And I'm going to open that up to the panel. Um, um, let me try to, to answer that, because I think at the heart of it lies the magic of a functioning system, um, which is to say, uh, what we probably need is a system that has a number of, of core standards set search centrally, and with a number of uh, commercial issues dealt with centrally that may be too complex for the, a decentralized point of engagement, but allow lots of different actors inside outside government at an inverted commas decentralized level to operate. Unfortunately, I think what we have, it, it, well, let's put positively, we, with the GDS standards, uh, the standards formulated by the government digital service, um, with them gaining traction, we have a much greater acceptance across the system, centrally, locally, kind of what good looks like. Um, and that's enormously possible. Uh, what we still don't have are some of the sort of core infrastructural elements that need to be set at the center that then other people at a decentralized, decentralized level can plug in on. You know, we have talked in the report and, and other panelists like to say no more about this than I do, you know, about the absence of, of a digital identity system. Today, we have lots of systems, some are central, in fact, several central and some are local and, and, and they don't really speak to each other. So you can be required to operate lots of different ones at any given time. And as a, as a user, as a business or as a charity or as a, an individual, you get the worst of all worlds. Um, a, a, another good example to use is um, the way that the NHS has decided to procure technology for GPs is, a, is an interesting example. It has basically said, we will set standards centrally and we will assure product centrally and then GPs can go off and within a sort of catalog of products be allowed to buy what they want. Now, in theory, that ought to work brilliantly. In practice, what it means is that the center tends to micromanage exactly what needs to happen decentrally. And so the final point I wanted to make here is, 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 is we both have to put these infrastructural elements in place, but it's also a cultural point. Um, you know, the, if the center lays out certain things um, and polices those standards or offers those infrastructural elements, then it, it needs to leave the front line to determine how they want an interface in a government, in a GP patient record system to look like, rather than try to decide that, you know, a thousand miles away in Leeds and NHS Digital. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I think it'll be easier for the UK to solve that uh, than the US. Um, but it's 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 really focusing on what is the core that government should be, central government should be doing. What is the core of those standards, and then and then the ecosystem around it. I completely agree. Hussein yeah. Erotica, did you want to add to that? The one way I look at it is yeah. uh, preference for because if it specifically depends on what is meant by centralized versus decentralized implementation. But uh, if it is actually building things, developing things, and bringing them to fruition, a decentralized model is much better because the advantages of you can move quicker, you know what your local needs are, and so on and so forth. But at an infrastructure layer, it ought to be centralized. So that uh, the, the focus and effort becomes around building an infrastructure to help a decentralized approach so that any organization, any unit, any department, and so on is able to take from that uh, infrastructure layer what they need to make progress on what they want. And there's a broader shift, uh, as Daniel mentioned, in, in so far as the mindset goes, so that um, the government as a whole and specific policymakers are more outcome focused. And therefore, if you're outcome focused and you're, you're, you're starting with a problem and then you're thinking through how do we solve this problem, you, you then have a broader toolkit to, to pick into your solutions from. So as part of the recommendations, a new digital, a new national digital council or an office for digital effectiveness uh, as well as the digital task forces and so on. They are designed in some ways to help and uh, move towards decentralization, but an oversight and improvement and essentially accountability layer where you get the best of both worlds around making sure the best technologies and the most effective and appropriate ones are being used, but not going down to just uh, a, a centralized model for all because a centralized model for all and at, at every small and big problem, 
just creates bottlenecks and delays. Yeah, and I would agree with, with all of that. I think the, the one thing I would say is we have this debate. I mean, I've been doing this you know, nearly three decades and we've been having this debate for three decades. And one thing that I think people forget is why, why would you centralize and why would you decentralize, right? What, what, is, what is the reason, right? You centralize something in a hub and spoke model, you would centralize it for control and you would decentralize it for flexibility. So if what you're trying to do requires control, then you would lean towards centralization and it's a defensive position that you would eff effectively have. So if there are parts of your system where, for example, data privacy is a massive issue, you know, you would, you would choose to centralize it because you want the control and, and the regulatory uh, ability there. Why would you choose to decentralize something? Because you want innovation and flexibility. Innovation and flexibility is not driven through centralized uh, notions. And so figuring out, understanding why you would be on that, where you would be on that spectrum and where, why that spectrum gives you, you know, different things at, at different points, I think helps you make the decision on a case by case basis. There isn't one answer to this, you know, different parts of the system will need different, to be at different points in that spectrum. And I think just understanding where you want to drive innovation, recognizing it might result in a bit, bit less control and where you need control, recognizing it'll drive a bit less innovation, it will help you make those choices, I think, across the system. Thanks a lot. I really, I really like that framework. That's a good way to think about it. Um, so really specifically, we've talked a little bit about the uh, digital ID system. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to ask Hussein and then other panelists to, to go into it. But what does government need to do to put into place a viable digital ID system? And kind of what are the first key steps to take? So uh, as Daniel kind of uh, briefly pointed to, we have historically had somewhat of a centralized system on a, diff, uh, a number of different ones. We have in the UK had uh, a kind of a shared identity ecosystem for a long time. It's a credit bureau model where there, there are essentially three credit bureaus that enable the sharing of that data. So what the fortunate and lucky things, uh, lucky cases that we can point to, whether it's Estonia, Singapore and elsewhere, is that the technology now exists to have a much better infrastructure to help individuals be able to prove their digital identity in an increasingly remote working world, in fact, uh, and, and therefore enable trade and security and access and all the other benefits that come with it. So to your question of what ought the government's role to be, it goes back to developing an infrastructure and specifically trust frameworks and standards to say, you as a provider need to meet certain thresholds. You need to be able to be accessible to maybe the partially uh, blind or, or, or so on and so forth. So we make sure that as many of the population, uh, as much of the population can, can be involved. Secondly, these are some security thresholds that you need to meet to prevent forces uh, entering the system and so on and so forth. So the Digital Identity Council being relatively new is a good step forward in that identity is typically priority three or four across different departments, but when in aggregate, you might be number one or number two. So the first move is now having some sort of centralized decision-making process in it. And in fact, in the last two years, there's been some significant progress in, in this regard and that standards are being developed to enable this sort of model whereby at the top in a centralized way, the standards uh, and uh, trust frameworks are developed and then private organizations and others can get involved to, to bring about this ecosystem. Can I, add, I wanna add a point that Gisela Stewart asked in the chat because I think it's related to this, which is, um, and, and we may be coming on to it in, in a more fulsome way later, but. Um, there's an ongoing concern whenever government does something about data uh, by certain uh, segments of the population. Some would argue, you know, justifiably, some would argue um, uh, paranoically, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, it's a fact. Uh, and, and the answer is, well, how, how do you deal with that? Since um, everybody knows that, that the smart use of data can be so powerful uh, in everything from uh, prevention, uh, to problem uh, spotting, et cetera, et cetera. I think it goes back to some of the things Hussein was saying, which is, you know, what's, your, what's your framework of trust? Uh, what's the governance arrangement for the use of some of these things? What's your redress mechanism? Um, and, and whenever government fails to be clear about who's in charge to deliver what, to what KPI, um, with an independent system to verify and a redress mechanism for people to raise, you know, complaints when things don't go wrong, which inevitably they do in human affairs, uh, then, then I think there's going to be less 
trust. If there's going to be less trust, there'll be less willingness to operate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I'm going to comment a little bit about that at our experience at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. One of the things that we did was create a complaint database. So that means as a, as a consumer, if you had an issue with Chase or a bank or a student loan that wasn't getting redressed by the provider, you could send it into us, uh, which is a very controversial database. And then we released that data, obviously anonymized. But what it did, and it took a lot of, of, um, of, of, debate and still a very controversial database, but it actually changed the market. It changed the bank's behavior. And I think like we were just super smart about the purpose of it and why, how we wanted to do it. And obviously making sure that individuals um, identity was, was concealed and safe. But, um, but I think once you get the strategy right, it can be an incredibly powerful tool across the piece. Uh, Radhika, did you want to comment at all about, about this? No, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with what was said. The, you know, it, it is about matching um, the strength of the, you know, it, it's about keeping an equivalent match between the strength of the state and the strength of the citizen. And I think, you know, when you grow the strength of the state through something like digital identity, you have to also provide opportunities to grow the strength of the citizen to have a voice in that state. And when those two things are kept in line, then, you know, I, I think democracies flourish. And when one goes, out of, out of whack with the other that's when you know we start getting issues so I, I completely agree with Dan creating creating mechanisms for citizens to engage in government and you know get that that sense of engagement sense of power uh, I think is is an important cor corollary to uh, anything we do that increases the power of government fantastic thanks um yeah so when we're kind of looking end to end, what's the role of the treasury and what does it need to play in supporting all of these proposals? Breast tax time. Well, if, if there's um, just two small things to, to share, one is around um, having where possible kind of a proposals that are geared towards what's the problem, how we're gonna solve that with outcomes and a more of a KPI based approach uh, in that as and when investments are made, where, and, and ideally wherever possible these would be published and like uh, open for all to see. These are the milestones that uh, could be achieved with it for every pound uh, of investment. A second uh, component, which, which could add in as one of the recommendations, is where possible to broaden out the pool of uh, suppliers or technology providers where, 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 where you can. So whether it's a number, I mean, 10% is, is an example of the budgets ought to be spent on newer companies that have formed in the last five years, 10 years, whatever that is. So that um, giving by sheer nature, most government contracts are large and therefore they go to incumbents that are already large. And you, you're kind of missing out on some of the new uh, approaches and ways uh, that companies can, or startups and scale ups can, can offer. So those are two components that maybe we're thinking about. Um, I, I could try to pick up. Um, I think there, there are a couple of issues here. Um, government is actually getting much better at piloting things. Um, you know, there's a joke now, uh, which is the government has more pilots than BA. I don't think it's quite that bad. Um, maybe the number of pilots in BA has dropped so dramatically over the course of this crisis that it's become true. But that's. Uh, but my my. But government is increasingly willing to pilot things. Um, what government is really bad at is scaling things, and there are lots of reasons to do with that. But the, the, some of the reasons are related to this question, which is how do you fund things? And what we often see um, is uh, an unwillingness to quickly uh, fund things uh, to scale when they succeed. And it's great to see that the government has um, is considering the U.S. Um, model of the 10x fund to uh, to more rapidly scale up. Uh, things that that, uh, that, that, uh, that that do succeed. Um, the second thing is, um, I think there is a little bit of a, 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 a problem in the way that the treasury accounts for things, you know, it's, it's harder to move uh, pots of money around in departments between operating costs and capital costs. And yet, that's exactly what's required in order to make a success of investments into, you know, cloud infrastructure. Um, and the third thing I'd say is I think we have, uh, I, you know, I, I want to say two other things. The third thing is to say that we do not count the cost of legacy when actually it, we ought to, and the failure to take in 
uh, the cost of the status quo is a massive problem. And the final thing I'd say is the government is too often allowing um, ultimately dysfunctional markets to exist uh, and spend too little time to kind of uh, create markets of suppliers to them that aren't basically monopolistic or duopolistic. And that's why in the report we, we say, you know, that the treasury should think about some kind of way of measuring and indexing market concentration in markets that are dedicated to the government as a buyer. Because, because the treasury is very good at using the, the Herfindahl index when it wants to evaluate whether the games industry is too concentrated or whether the uh, you know, leisure hotel industry is too concentrated. Um, but it ought to think carefully about what happens in the markets where it is the sole or the most dominant buyer. Uh, and, and I think treasury needs to do more work in that space. Yeah, I, Roderick, I just want to comment on that really quick. I, I, I hate to say it was one of my favorite parts of the paper, actually, <laughs> was, the, was the procurement section because it was really actionable. <laughs> and a lot of, there's been always for decades talk about procurement reform, but what I appreciated is how what we're doing is actually trying to tie it to budgets, to controls, to making sure that end to end we can actually open up the process and hold while also holding uh, not accountable, but um, somewhat accountable for our, our legacy systems and really examining that and how they got there and what's next for that. If that's a process or a system that we want to maintain, I, I appreciate that. Radek, I'm sorry, over, over and to you. I, I was going to disagree with Dan and say this market failure point I think is extremely important. One of the things I think HMT should be doing more of is thinking about its role in funding the common good. So where there are cross silo issues and they won't be picked up in the normal machinery of government, there are platform plays that would benefit everybody, but nobody, no one person will invest in them. Um, there are preventative measures. I mean, this is the big hole, isn't it? There are preventative measures that we could be funding that would have a massive cross system impact, whether it's in health space or the criminal justice space, but because it falls between multiple departments, we don't fund the preventative measures the way we should. And therefore we pick up the cost all the way through the system. So these are common goods, you know, that, that perhaps don't have a natural home in our current machinery of government that, you know, I think HMT ought to, you know, be, be quite a bit more proactive about looking at. Fantastic. Thank you. So we've talked a little bit about how, H, you know, HMT's role in this. And I guess kind of next is what are some of the other key levers to implement this change program? We've talked a little bit about leadership, but investment procurement data systems and the proposed digital task forces. Is there anything else that anyone wanted to mention on, you know, on the next steps and the other levers that we could create and identify? I mean, there's so many uh, good recommendations and we've talked a little bit about making, um, uh, you know, making technology core of what government does. I want to pick up on something that Paul Marshall alluded to in, uh, in one of the chats, which is, you know, how do we bring good people in? And it's something we, we grappled with uh, in, in the report as well. You know, how do, we, how do we bring the right leaders in to do the right things, uh, which is something every organization grapples with. Uh, and of course, the private sector is, is well versed at. Um, and the answer, and we've tried to deal with that in a number of ways. First of all, I think we have to pay people more. Uh, but we also have to expect more and be clear about what they have to achieve for that more. Uh, and as it happens, we are not good enough at, at paying people more because we're trying to fit them into existing systems. Uh, where do you as a technologist fit into this bureaucratic system that we've created for an entirely different kind of skill set and career path? So we need to kind of have some kind of sui generis way of integrating this talent. We have to find a way to incentivizing it as it moves. Um, and we also have to find a way to create potential for opportunities um, elsewhere in the system. You know, um, we don't necessarily, uh, I would argue, we don't necessarily want to make these kind of people, you know, career civil servants, but we might want to offer people a kind of digital career path in government that isn't uh, over after the first job that you do or isn't only focused on, you know, a certain level. Uh, and so, you know, better pay, more rigorous, you know, KPI incentives as you are, you know, in the system um, and, and, you know, career paths uh, in the system at various different levels. Uh, I think that is the only way I can think of to bring, you know, more talented people in to the system. 
And if I can add to that, once the talent is in the system, you've got to actually what talent needs is three things, right? They need to be given responsibility that they will appreciate and enjoy. They need to be given the levers to, uh, you know, to, to be able to do, do what they need to against that responsibility. And they need to be given support. And I think if you look at just those three things and almost you know, forget everything else, give them the responsibility, give them the levers, and they, they will tell you what levers they need. If they need training, they'll tell you, you know, but give them the levers and then give them the support in a tough journey because things will go wrong. And that's what keeps talent in, inside. You don't always have to sort of pre-think everything. You, you know, there is an element of letting good people inside and then standing back. If there's one thing to, that, that um, I would add that maybe everyone can relate to is uh, transparency and, and openness. And the UK government does a decent job of this. And especially when it comes to opening data, access to anonymized healthcare and so on, there's actually so much more than people first uh, see but if we just think through the covid sort of um rates of of how many the death rate and now more recently the number of vaccines that have been rolled out just by sheer release of this data as we have seen it kind of goes back to building up confidence which is a good thing so the power of technology and digitization when it comes to opening up data and reporting and things of that nature can help build trust quite quite a bit. And I think it's one of the areas that uh, has already started, but it can, it can improve even more. And on your earlier suggestion around there being a third party source or method to go and, uh, and raise a complaint, setting up a digital uh, ombudsman is another recommendation where uh, independent complaints can be made um, as and when things potentially don't go right. So you're building an accountability uh, throughout and, and helping impart that trust. I'm a huge transparency fan, so I, I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, so I guess taking a step back, fast, well, actually taking a step forward, five years from now, what do you want this leadership team that's, you know, currently been placed in the government, what do you want them to have achieved? What's the, what are the, what's the headline that you want them to that you want to write yourself for the tweet. 56 out of 56 recommendations successfully implemented. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, no, joking aside, I think there is uh, quite a bit of this uh, has been based on the commission's sort of hard work, bringing together examples of what is happening elsewhere. So some of this may, may seem um, completely new, but I would say a healthy chunk of it, it already exists and it's been successfully proven elsewhere. And there are many great benefits of piloting and, and, and doing things like that here. That can be shortcuts. Uh, there can be ways of doing that faster if you just take examples from elsewhere and implement it where possible. So the hope is that beyond these recommendations is increasingly learning from other countries that are ahead in some of these ways, seeing the potential and therefore shortening the gap between like discovery and imp implementation and going for some of these uh, low hanging fruits that have been suggested. Thank you. I guess I I am um, I will then try to answer that sort of the other end of the telescope. Obviously, I agree with Hussein. They should do fifty. What do you mean fifty six? How about you know fifty seven? Whatever. But um, I think there's a bigger point, which is when will we have succeeded? You know, when the chatter is no longer, oh, didn't that app fail? Or you know, wasn't that a disaster with the algorithm that sorted the exams? You know, when the broader impression as a result of a lot of these things is you know what, technology is improving our services. You know, almost you could say, you know, you don't need a thousand metrics. You need like one metric, which is, do citizens believe that public services have become better or, 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 or more digitally uh, improved? And, and if the answer to that over time is no, then it doesn't really matter that you've done a bunch of these different things. And so I, I would sort of speak to a kind of bold, um, but kind of very sort of client facing metric uh, that will be super hard and you can argue that it'll contribute a lot of things will contribute to it but arguably you know a large company has a has a very simple set of metrics and it can argue as much as it wants that um, the recession hit it but at the end of the day that won't matter if if they're still not selling the product or arguably you could say the US military has a very simple metric they want to be the best military in the world and uh, and you know if it procures a bunch of great weapon systems at a good price but loses the wars, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, so I would speak to a kind of bold but citizen slash client facing 
metric. Love it. Radhika? So the question is, where do we want to be in five years? Five years is not long. It's not, it, you know, it, <laughs> it goes in a snap of, of a finger. And if we were standing, having this panel, you know, hypothetically, uh, five years from now, what I'd like to be able to look back and see is that we've created the foundations to be a much more innovative, flexible, you know, uh, adaptive um, machinery of government. And the foundations require all of the things these gentlemen have talked about, you know, data and culture and skills and gaps. But building those foundations for the future, I think, is what I would lean towards and, and focus on. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go to a question in the chat, and it's, it's about optimism. So OpenCast is a partner with the commission. Um, they have, they've just produced their own paper, and it's actually quite an optimistic one. It's looking at the, this is a chance to change to, you know, in the midst of the crisis to rebuild, essentially. Um, and so there, I'll just read it. Uh, so our optimism feels in contrast to the perception of failure presented at the start of the commission's latest paper. Is OpenCast wrong to kind of have a cause for optimism given, you know, given coronavirus and where we're at with Brexit? I don't see why you couldn't do both. Um, in that what, where I, I suppose if you take a step back and have an objective uh, view, it is fair to say that in the UK, we've fallen short on, on a number of areas. But that's more of a reason why there's a big gap to improve and therefore there should be excitement around all the uh, low hanging fruits and other things that can be done. We're by no means like very far behind, but it's very clear that a number of different countries have, got, have gone ahead. And so the intention I think is uh, just as optimistic on, on both fronts, but just to uh, frame where we are right now and some of the examples of where the gap is probably makes this uh, a little bit more real for people. I would also add one, one thing that's related and a bit of a follow-up uh, from Daniel's point in that most citizens' uh, interaction with the government beyond maybe voting every uh, four or five years is essentially when they want to do something, whether it's an admin task and they have to go in an office and, and go through bureaucracy and paperwork and so on, whereas giving them a digital experience, you know, 99% of the effort and resource and everything could, could be behind the scenes, but that 1% of the last step if that is through a very archaic process, their impression is that it's a whole all a mess, not seeing the back office being 99%. Whereas you just invest and put that layer of a smooth digital onboarding, uh, excuse me, or a digital experience, it kind of changes the whole mind frame. And it's like a delight to be uh, sort of working and operating these things. That part of the, you can now digitally renew your driving license, file your taxes and so on and so forth. Uh, all of these experiences contribute to people's perception of how competent the government uh, is when it comes to technology or has a potential to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think ultimately what we're trying to do is, is, is grounded in optimism because it is ultimately based on a belief that things can get better, that we have uh, levers that can improve, people who want to ultimately improve, the, the things can work. I think what we've tried to do, particularly in our earlier diagnostic paper, is to be honest about some of the good and some of the bad, and to say, you know, if you want to kind of tilt the balance towards the good, these are some things that we do. But it is, it is absolutely, as any reform act uh, is, is ultimately born um, out of optimism. Uh, you know, neg no, no reformers are negativists because they would just sort of, you know, uh, uh, hoard, hoard food, hide in their basements and, and wait for the end. Um, so ultimately we, we are very optimistic, but you know, optimism alone is not the fuel for a journey. Uh, we kind of need to make some, take some serious steps in order to, to, to get to where we want to get to. Thanks. Radhika? I, I completely agree. You know, the, we have to be optimistic. And actually there is genuine cause for optimism at a meta level. You know, there are new technologies that are being produced. Look at the speed at which we've produced the, you know, the vaccines, um, technological, you know, um, progress is happening at pace. And therefore the potential, the potential for us to have, you know, um, uh, genuine change um, for the betterment of society is there. And I think that's what drives us all is that that's happening. I think the other piece of this isn't, it isn't just that technology is getting better. We did a study recently and I was, you know, flabbergasted to find, we do the study every year and we, we look at, a exec, we talk to executives and find out 
how long they think it's going to take them to implement a whole series of technological changes. And every year we get a relatively steady answer and we look at you know, how, how quickly technologies are maturing. And this year we did it and we asked them how long it would take. And actually we were flabbergasted that many executives and private companies had already implemented the things that they were talking about. And in reality, it had happened 20 to 40 times faster than they had predicted. <coughs> so when you need to, <laughs> it can be done 20 to 40 times faster globally. So not only is technology improving, but actually our ability to implement it is a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. And I think therein lies the opportunity that we should be grasping with both hands inside the machinery of government as well. That's super optimistic. And I, you know, I think like just to be brutally honest, there's no longer an excuse. Coronavirus has shown us that it's actually totally possible to work from home overnight to shield the most vulnerable from home overnight, to do all this work, and uh, and there's just no longer an excuse to not to not get it done. Uh, so we're almost out of time. I was just wondering if there are any final closing thoughts that any of the panelists wanted to give. I, I thought um, what both you and Radhika ended on is just the most uh, apt point, which is um, it can be done, and in fact, it is being done. Uh, it, you know, it, it's back to that uh, phrase, I think, of, uh, uh, you know, the future's here, it just is uneven. Digital transformation is here, it's just uneven. And I think if there's anything we need to do is to kind of make it even so that so that all the people, to Hussein's point, that, that avail themselves of government services get the experience that a small group already get, whatever they do. Uh, and so... Digital transformation is already here. It's just uneven. Now the exercise is to make it even, uh, and that is in, imminently possible. We've shown it to be the case. We just gotta, we just gotta knuckle down and get it, get on with it. And once you even it out, it'll be even easier to build on top of it. It'll be even easier to jump over the fence, hopefully, in a in a good way. Um, any other comments from Hussein or Radhika? It, it's, I think just last point is it's very much the beginning and that these things are a, a snapshot of where we are and what can be done, but it's an ongoing process. So we're looking forward to keeping this updated and improving it over time. So I'm sure whoever has contributions or suggestions to make, uh, please do be in touch. And I think the final point from me is um, I would say, you know, when we look at the business case for digitization from a private sector perspective, we look at costs and we look at benefits. I think one of the things we ought to just remind ourselves when we think about this from a public sector perspective is there is a moral imperative for action in many cases. And let's not forget that that ought to also drive us faster um, than a, a simple business case analysis should. So I'll call it the why are we waiting test. <laughs> and with that mic drop, we will close the panel. Thank you so much for the moral urgency and you're absolutely right. Uh, so I just wanted to thank all of our panelists, all the commissioners who were able to join and all the attendees. Um, if there's any other, anything else, um, did Sophie, did you want to say anything? Daniel? No? All right, fantastic. All right, great. So go check out the paper on the website and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reese.